Good afternoon. My name is Natasha Oyudeli, and I want to welcome you to the NIH Office of Disease Prevention's Methods Mind the Gap webinar series. This series explores research design, measurement, intervention, data analysis, and other methods of interest to prevention science. Our goal is to engage the prevention research community in thought-provoking discussions to promote the use of best available methods and support the development of better methods. Before we begin, I have some housekeeping items. You can submit questions during the webinar by clicking on the question mark in the WebEx toolbar. Please direct all questions to all panelists. We will open the floor for questions that have been submitted via WebEx at the conclusion of today's talk. The slides and video recording will be posted on our website, prevention.nih.gov backslash mind the gap in approximately one week. You will receive an email when they are available. Lastly, we would appreciate your feedback about today's webinar. Upon closing the WebEx meeting, you will be prompted to complete an evaluation. We would appreciate your feedback as it will help us improve this webinar series. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. David M. Murray, Associate Director for Prevention and Director of the Office of Disease Prevention. Thank you, Natasha. Today's speaker is Dr. Linda Collins. Dr. Collins is the Distinguished Professor of Human Development and Family Studies at the Pennsylvania State University. She's also Director of the Methodology Center, an interdisciplinary research center devoted to the advancement and dissemination of quantitative methods for applications in drug abuse prevention and treatment, as well as other areas in the behavioral sciences. Dr. Collins' research interests include the multiphase optimization strategy, or MOST, an engineering-inspired methodological framework for optimizing and evaluating behavioral, biobehavioral, and biomedical interventions. The objective of MOST is to improve intervention effectiveness, efficiency, economy, and scalability. Dr. Collins is currently collaborating on research applying MOST to develop optimized behavioral interventions in several different areas, including smoking cessation, weight loss, prevention of excessive drinking and risky sex in college students, and HIV services. It's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Linda Collins. Thank you, David. It's uh, really great to be here. So uh, as, as uh, David mentioned, I'm going to be talking today about uh, the multiphase optimization strategy, uh, optimization of uh, prevention interventions using most. I gave a, uh, a talk, a Mind the Gap talk, Gap talk about this a, a number of years ago, um, I think about five or six years ago now. And I thought I would kind of um, recap a little bit of what I said then and talk about the current state of the science and, and future directions. So first, let's talk for a moment about the massive improvements there have been in technology over the past 30 years. So think back to uh, the mid-1980s, uh, the late 20th century. A lot of us were using uh, this kind of cell phone, a, a flip phone, where uh, you could text using that, but it was quite a, a project because uh, to get certain letters you had to press three times. I remember I never quite got the hang of that. And today we have uh, amazing smartphones that can do uh, so many more things than those uh, flip phones could do. I was the proud owner of a compact portable. That was the first kind of uh, portable computer, which I, I know admitting that dates me, but I really loved that thing. But now I have a, a laptop that I can just stick in my purse and go, which is really great. And uh, this is a BMW 3 Series car from the mid-1980s. It got about 18 miles per gallon, and it did not have any airbags. And this is a current um, BMW 3 Series. It now gets 27 miles per gallon, and it has lots of airbags. It's, it's just a much, much safer car. So consider these massive improvements in technology, and as I talk today, I'd like you to keep this question in mind. Have prevention interventions improved this much? Have they improved as much as these other improvements in technology? Have they kept up with these other improvements? Here's the outline of what I'm going to talk about today. First, I'm going to compare business as usual to a new perspective. Uh, then I'll go back to uh, the two projects I mentioned in my 2013 Mind the Gap talk. One uh, was an optimization of a smoking cessation intervention. The other was an optimization of a weight reduction intervention. Talk about the, the status of those projects. And then I'll end with a little bit about the state of the science and, and future directions in this area because a lot is happening in this area. 
So first, business as usual compared to a new perspective on things. This is business as usual. The, I'll call this the classical treatment package approach. In the classical treatment package approach, the intervention scientist identifies uh, a number of components. Uh, I have five here, but it could be any, any number of components. Uh, assembles them, perhaps pilot tests them first, and assembles them into an intervention. And that intervention is then evaluated by means of a standard randomized controlled trial, or RCT. Now, imagine that you conduct an, this RCT and you find a significant effect, which is great. But what don't you know at this point? You don't know which components are making positive contributions to the overall effect that you observed and which are not. You don't know and you can't tell whether the inclusion of one component has an impact on the effect of another. It could be that a particular component, let's call it component A, works great in the presence of component B, but if component B is absent, doesn't work at all. And you don't know whether a component's contribution offsets its cost. Many interventions are made up of components that vary widely in cost. And for the more expensive ones, you might want to know that uh, those more expensive ones are having a correspondingly larger effect, that they're pulling their weight uh, corresponding to what they cost. One example of this, I think, is motivational interviewing. This is, uh, I see, uh, increasingly popular among intervention scientists that I work with. Motiva mo uh, motivational interviewing is great, but um, to do it right can be very expensive. First of all, the interview itself is time consuming, and secondly, it takes resources to train people properly, and if a, st a staff member who has been doing motivational interviewing leaves, you have to replace the person and train the new person. So if you, if you, if you figured out how much motivational interviewing cost over the life of an intervention, it's, it's much more expensive than many other components. So you might want to know when, when, you're consider when you're considering including motivational interviewing, you might want to know that it has a correspondingly large effect. And in general, when you conduct an RCT, you don't get it, the information you need to improve the intervention the next time. What, what should you do to make the intervention more effective, more efficient, and more scalable? That information is not, is not there in an RCT. Now, I want to emphasize I'm not, this is not meant to be a put down of the RCT. The RCT is uh, the accepted standard, and I think rightly so, for evaluation of interventions. But it does not contain the inf kind of information that we're looking for here. Now, suppose uh, you're less fortunate and your RCT delivers a non-significant effect. What don't you know at this point? You don't know whether any of those components that made up the, the intervention package that you evaluated are worth retaining. All you can really do is chuck them all and start over again, but there might be some keepers in there. You don't know. It's even possible that one component had a negative effect that offset the positive effect of other components, and you would have a successful intervention if you just got rid of one or two uh, really poorly performing, even iatrogenic components. And perhaps most frustratingly, and I think this is what really uh, distresses people when they get uh, non-significant results in an RCT, it's really hard to tell specifically what went wrong and how to do it better the next time. The way forward is often very unclear. Let's talk about four desiderata for behavioral and biobehavioral interventions. The first one, of course, we're all familiar with is effectiveness. Uh, and we'll define that uh, using Flay's definition, the extent to which the intervention does more good than harm under real world conditions. The field of intervention science has emphasized effectiveness uh, since the beginning, and effectiveness is really important. But I would argue that there are three other important desiderata that we don't pay enough attention to. One of them is efficiency, and I'll define that as the extent to which the intervention avoids wasting time, money, or other valuable resources. If you just stop for a minute and think about the interventions you know, and how many inactive components there probably are in those interventions. And all those inactive components are doing is wasting time and money. Economy, the extent to which the intervention is effective without exceeding budgetary constraints and in general offers a good value. Now efficiency and economy are 
related but different. It's uh, completely possible for an intervention to be efficient in the sense that it doesn't contain any inactive components, but it may still cost more than your budget would allow to implement. And the last one I'll mention is scalability. This is the extent to which the intervention can be implemented in the intended setting exactly as it was evaluated in an RCT. So the idea here is that when an intervention at the point at which an intervention is evaluated in an RCT, it should be completely scalable. There should be no need for post hoc ad hoc modifications to make uh, an intervention scalable. And those ad hoc modifications, which often are done if an intervention uh, has been demonstrated to be effective without any regard to efficiency, economy, or scalability, those ad hoc modifications in which the individual responsible for implementing the intervention says, wow, this intervention is just too time consuming or too expensive. Uh, we're going to remove this component and this component. They're very dangerous because you never know whether the components that are removed are the ones that were responsible for the effect that was observed in the RCT. So let's talk about what I mean by optimization of an intervention. It's the process of identifying the intervention that provides the best expected outcome obtainable, but within key constraints imposed by the need for efficiency, economy, and or scalability. So there's a little bit of a tug of war here between effectiveness on the one hand and efficiency, economy, and scalability on the other hand. If you don't worry at all about uh, efficiency or economy, for example, you probably will be able to uh, come up with a more effective intervention, but it might never see the light of day. It might never actually be able to be implemented. So the multi-phase optimization strategy is an alternative to the classical treatment package approach that takes all of these considerations into account. Most is an engineering-inspired framework for development, optimization, and evaluation of interventions. And as you're going to see in a moment, most incorporates the RCT as part of it. So this is definitely not anti-RCT. And using the multi-phase optimization strategy, you can actually engineer an intervention to meet a specific criterion. This is a schematic of the multi-phase optimization strategy. This is taken from my book, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. There are three phases, preparation, optimization, and evaluation. So I'm going to talk about each of those in turn. In the preparation phase, the purpose is to lay the groundwork for optimization. Now, most of what uh, is contained in the preparation phase is going to be pretty familiar to uh, all of you intervention scientists. As part of this phase, you review any prior research, take stock of clinical experience, you would conduct any secondary analyses that are going to inform uh, the intervention, uh, and so on. You derive a conceptual model that expresses the uh, process that leads to the outcome you're trying to uh, affect and then shows um, exactly what the causal factors are. You would select intervention components to examine based on the conceptual model. So the intervention co components are each of them targets a part of the causal process. Any pilot or feasibility work would be conducted as a part of the preparation phase. And you also would identify a clearly operationalized optimization criterion, which we can talk about more a little later if, if we like. The next phase is the optimization phase. And this is the one that, that's really different. The objective of the optimization phase is to form a treatment package that meets the optimization criterion that you've selected. So, for example, perhaps the optimization criterion you've selected is you want to identify the most effective intervention you, you can build that can be implemented for $500 a person or less. So you want the most effective intervention you can build, but a constraint is it has to cost no more than $500 a person to implement. You would uh, do that in the optimization phase by conducting a randomized experiment that would give you information on the performance of individual intervention components and, uh, depending on the experimental design, potentially interactions between uh, these individual intervention components. And based on this information that you've gathered as part of the experiment, 
you would select the components and levels that give you the best expected outcome that costs less than $500 a person to implement. So that's the basic idea of the optimization phase. I'm going to, that probably seems very abstract, but I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to give a couple of examples in a moment that I think will make it a little more concrete. The last phase is the evaluation phase, and the purpose of this phase is to establish whether the optimized intervention has a statistically significant effect as a package compared to a suitable control. And uh, the experimental design there would be uh, the, the randomized control trial. Before we go too much farther, I'd like to review some kind of conceptual differences or differences in perspective between the classical approach and most, because most is really a very different way of thinking about uh, intervention development and evaluation. So in the next few slides, I'm going to be kind of comparing and contrasting the classical approach and most. The objective of the classical approach is to develop an intervention that demonstrates a statistically and, of course, clinically significant effect in an RCT. The objective of most is a little different. The objective of most is to develop an, is to do that, to develop uh, an intervention that demonstrates that statistically and clinically significant effect in an RCT. That's really important. But in addition, and equally important, the objective is to meet specific predetermined standards of effectiveness, efficiency, cost effectiveness, and or scalability. So the intervention has to be not only statistically and clinic clinically significant in an RCT, but it also, for example, has to be the best, has to deliver the best expected outcome for $500 a person or less, to use the example I gave a moment ago. Now the next steps after identification and pilot testing of components. In the classical approach, the intervention would immediately be assembled and then evaluated as a package in an RCT. But in most, you would not go directly to the RCT. Instead, you would conduct an optimization trial. I'm going to talk um, more about the optimization trial in a moment, but the optimization trial is that experiment I talked about before that gives you information about the effectiveness of individual components. The experimental designs used, the classical approach for uh, many years has relied uh, almost exclusively on the RCT to the exclusion of any other kind of experimental design. In most, for the optimization trial, you would select an experimental design out of the whole universe of experimental designs based on the resource management principle. And that's a very simple principle that says that the investigator is responsible for selecting experimental designs and experimental procedures that deliver the most scientific information for the available resources. Then, uh, for the evaluation of the intervention as a package in the evaluation phase, most, again, would primarily use, use the RCT. Now, most of us on this webinar have been trained as scientists, and I think in your scientific training you learned that no one experimental design is useful for addressing every single experimental question. Instead, the selection of experimental design should be based on the experimental question, and so this is an explicit acknowledgement of, of that. Depending on the scientific question that you pose when developing uh, an intervention, you might want to use different experimental designs. Examination of the effectiveness of individual intervention components. In the classical approach, that's done primarily by conducting post hoc analyses on data from an RCT. In most, that's done before the RCT, and it's done primarily by means of experimental manipulation of components, direct experimental manipulation of components. Inclusion of inert or counterproductive components. I think it's interesting that in the classical approach, uh, we never really talk about this, but it is generally uh, accepted that an intervention is going to have inert or counterproductive components, and that's okay, as long as the overall effectiveness of the intervention can be demonstrated. But in most, uh, this is not tolerated. In fact, um, a big part of most is getting rid of such components because they reduce efficiency. So just want to mention some possibilities that are offered by most. Uh, you can engineer interventions to be cost-effective. The way cost-effectiveness is, is typically uh, assessed today. First, an intervention is developed using the classical treatment package approach, and after that, uh, its cost-effectiveness is uh, assessed, and if the intervention is not cost-effective, then what? 
the, the way forward is a bit unclear, but uh, using most, you could actually in engineer an intervention to have a, a specific level of cost effectiveness. You also can engineer interventions to be immediately scalable and sustainable. If you know what the constraints are when an intervention uh, is to be implemented, you can actually incorporate those into the optimization criterion. So, for example, suppose uh, an intervention is being uh, administered in the emergency department. Well, you're not going to have three hours to, uh, to implement that intervention. It's something that probably could take no more than 10 minutes. I'm just making that up, but things have to be done quickly in the emergency department. So you could select a set of components that would give you the best expected outcome that, uh, that, that could be delivered in 10 minutes or less. You can conduct a single optimization trial and potentially optimize using different criteria for different situations. Now, of course, this would re require the assumption that the, the uh, sample that you use for the optimization trial would, would, would generalize to that, the new population. But suppose, for example, that you conducted, that you optimized an intervention that, that gave you uh, the best expected outcome for $500 a person or less. Now suppose uh, a, a more resource poor area says, we would love to have an intervention like this, but we only have $300 a person. Well, if you can make that assumption that the optimization trial would, could reasonably apply there, you could then use the results of the same optimization trial to determine what set of components gives you the best expected outcome for $300 a person or less. Okay. Now, the two projects I mentioned in my 2013 Mind the Gap talk, which I'm sure <laughs> None of you really remember that closely, but I talked about uh, smoking cessation and weight management, two different studies. So let's first talk about the smoking cessation study. This was a primary care-based smoking cessation study, and the PIs uh, are, uh, Mike, were Mike Fury and Tim Baker at the University of Wisconsin, and the investigative team included uh, Robin Mermelstein at the University of Illinois Chicago, Megan Piper, who's also at the University of Wisconsin, and me. Uh, it was uh, first funded by P50 and then a, a, the next uh, phase of research was funded by uh, PO1. This was the first full cycle of most, and Mike and Tim were the first people who were really ready to take most out for a spin, and I'll always be grateful to them for that, and it's really been uh, amazing working with them over the years. Okay, so this is just to remind us of uh, the phases of most preparation, optimization, and evaluation, and I'm going to talk for a moment about the optimization trials that we ran. In this study, we ran three different optimization trials. Uh, one of them was focused on the weeks, uh, components pertaining to the weeks leading up to and immediately following the quit date. In this study, everyone had to uh, establish a quit date. Uh, a second optimization trial was focused on maintaining abstinence after the quit date. And a third one was focused on smokers who were not yet ready to quit. These are the components that were being examined in the, that first optimization trial. Uh, pre-cessation use of a nicotine patch, pre-cessation uh, ad lib or oral uh, nicotine replacement that was gum or uh, a lozenge if people preferred that. Uh, and I want to stop for a moment and say, because Mike would, would want me to make this point clear, that uh, of course uh, NRT is standard of care in smoking cessation and actually everybody got nicotine replacements starting at the quit date, which is what the standard of care is. What we were experimentally manipulating here was whether uh, use of NRT was helpful before the quit date. Pre-cessation counseling, uh, cessation in-person counseling, cessation telephone counseling, and then medication maintenance duration. We were looking at 16 weeks versus, versus uh, a shorter period, eight weeks. The eight weeks was standard of care. So that's just an example. Uh, we actually conducted, as I said, three optimization trials, and the experimental designs uh, for that first one, the design, you see 2 to the 6 minus 1 there, that means that it was a fractional factorial design. Uh, we actually examined six factors, but the fractional factorial design cut the number of experimental conditions uh, in half, and I can talk more about that if you uh, are interested during the Q&A time. Uh, the second one focused on maintaining abstinence after the quit date. That was a 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 factorial experiment, or 2 to the 5th. And the last one, which is focused on smokers not yet, yet ready to quit, was a 2 to the 4th. Now, you may be wondering uh, why did we use uh, 
factorial experiments. We use factorial experiments because, uh, and this is perhaps counterintuitive to some people, it was certainly counterintuitive to me when I first learned about it, that factorial experiments uh, actually use uh, far fewer experimental subjects than alternatives. And that's something I've published about extensively, and I'd be happy to talk about it some more if you're interested. But based on the results of the, this experimentation, there were five winners among the components. Uh, Pre-cessation oral NRT, cessation phase in-person counseling set to the intensive level, and then extended medication. We had looked at uh, extending medication to 26 weeks in the second trial, and that turned out to be the best maintenance phase counseling telephone calls and then maintenance phase automated adherence calls. So these five components would make, uh, made up the optimized intervention. And this study has gone to the evaluation phase, and this has been published. We conducted uh, an RCT, and you can see that um, we, got, we did get significant results. Now, there's, of, of course, no guarantee that you'll get significant results. There's never any guarantee that anybody will ever get significant results. There's no guarantee that the optimized intervention uh, will, will give you a significant result in an RCT, but you do have a good sense uh, of, of whether you have a good set of potent uh, components going in. Now, the weight reduction study, the PIs of that, that study uh, are uh, Bonnie Spring, and me, we were jointly PIs in an, in, in an MPI arrangement. This was funded by NIDDK. The previous one, I think I said, was funded by NCI. This, is, this was funded by NIDDK. And there are some uh, publications that uh, talk about the protocol there. Everyone got a core intervention consisting of um, education, goal setting, skill building, and some technology tools. These were the components that we looked at in the optimization trial. Uh, Telephone-delivered coaching. Uh, there's been a lot of literature to suggest that telephone-delivered coaching is really helpful in, in weight loss. Uh, we were looking at whether 24 sessions was better than 12 sessions. Text messages, um, kind of encouraging text messages. Communication with the primary care physician. Uh, buddy training. Everyone had to... Uh, to be in the study, everyone had to be able to identify a buddy, but uh, people were randomly assigned to have their buddy get a special training or, or not. And then meal replacement recommendations. This uh, is, was a two to the fifth factorial design. Again, two by two by two by two by two factorial design. So some results of the optimization trial, which was concluded uh, fairly recently. Uh, buddy training had a significant main effect. Um, so, of course, we would select buddy training to go into the optimized intervention. Uh, there was no difference between 12 and 24 coaching sessions, so the lower level would be selected there. There was an interesting three-way interaction involving buddy training, a PCP communication, and text messages. This suggested that PCP communication should be included, even though it, it didn't have a main effect, but it, it did boost the effect of other components. And then, uh, if we didn't have any regard for cost, uh, buddy training, PCP communication, and then 12 sessions of coaching would be uh, the optimized intervention, but we are in the process of uh, incorporating information about cost. Okay, so those were the two projects uh, I mentioned in my 2013 talk, and now let's talk a little bit about uh, the state of the science and, and future directions. Earlier this year, I got on the NIH reporter because I was curious about uh, how many projects NIH has, has funded uh, to conduct optimization trials in one way or another. And it uh, looks like um, there are about 86 projects involving optimization trials, and these have been funded by 14 different uh, NIH ICs, and it's a quite, quite a wide variety of projects. And I've noticed that NIH uh, funding announcements are increasingly mentioning intervention optimization. I think there's, there's probably 10 right now that specifically mention that. And there also is evidence of interest in um, a number of, of other countries. Increasingly, I'm being asked to um, give workshops about most and speak about most in, in other countries. So that's all evidence that people are, these ideas are catching on and people are starting to be more comfortable with them, which is great. But it's definitely um, still not the norm. Uh, worldwide and in the United States, uh, the uh, uh, budgets that are devoted to intervention science overwhelmingly uh, are devoted to the treatment package approach rather than intervention optimization at, at this point. 
So some future directions. Uh, I'm very interested, and this is where my research is, is going now. I'm trying to retool. Uh, to have to learn a bunch of stuff to go in this direction. Decision making and bringing in cost and economic considerations. This is really a wide open area, decision making based on the results of, of an optimization trial. There is a chapter in my book on decision making, but it's very limited. Uh, it's limited to uh, some pretty specific situations which cover a, a fair amount of ground, but but still uh, it's it's important, I think, to have much better methodology for what you do when you have several outcome variables, for example. You might have um, several different costs, uh, cost dimensions that you're interested in, and they may not uh, necessarily be money. Some of them may be money. Some of them may be the amount of time something takes or could even be, I mean, I'm looking at cost broadly defined here. So anything that's kind of in the minus columns. So for example, uh, burden on burden on subjects, if that can be quantified, that could be considered a cost. And of course, all of these uh, would be in, in different, different metrics. So where I want to go is the integration of ideas from uh, economic analysis, from cost benefit, cost effectiveness analysis, and also multi-criteria decision analysis, uh, which is a way of integrating uh, all the information when you have, you know, different streams, you have different costs coming in, different different outcome variables in these very complex situations, and of course different different decision makers. Although it's it's a lot harder to know what to do about that. So that's uh, that's an important area for me, and I'm happy to say that I've been uh, collaborating with a really terrific health economist on on some new work in this area. I want to uh, on a, on a, a different uh, direction. I want to point out that in the optimization phase, there are a lot of different experimental designs that can be used. I talked uh, very briefly today about factorial experiments and fractional factorial experiments, but the sequential multiple assignment randomized trial or SMART trial is a type of optimization trial. Uh, uh, the micro randomized trial, Susan Murphy and, and others are working in that area. It's a very interesting kind of optimization trial that is particularly relevant to M health applications. Uh, system identification, that's a whole different. So the factorial, fractional factorial, SMART, micro randomized trial. Those are all closely related to the traditional factorial experiment. System identification is really a very different perspective on, on all of this. It comes out of control engineering. So you would conduct a system identification experiment and use the results of that to build a controller. A controller uh, uh, in much the same way you might build a controller for a climate control system. You can think of, of certain kinds of interventions actually as, as controllers. It's very, that's a very interesting area. So there's all those different uh, types of experimental designs and so I think there's a need for even more development in experimental design in a lot of areas. Uh, Danny Almaral and Billy Nayam Shani at Michigan are doing a lot of really interesting work on the sequential multiple assignment randomized trial. They're extending it for example to areas where you have to use cluster randomization. That's, that's, just, that's just one example. Micro randomized trials, very new area. Uh, Susan Murphy and Peja Klasnia uh, are, are working in that, that area. Very, very interesting uh, stuff there. Uh, and the control engineering perspective that I talked about a moment ago where you would conduct a system identification experiment. Uh, Daniel Rivera, who, who is a chemical engineer, has been working in that area for a number of years. And he also has been collaborating with Eric Heckler, who is at UC San Diego on applications of that. And there's just a lot more work to be done in all of these areas. Uh, experimental design and uh, data analysis. In particular, the micro-randomized trial uh, offers some really interesting challenges to, to data analysis. And for me, I would like to get involved in more applications and just see more applications of, of uh, optimization in more areas of public health. And of course, if it were up to me, I would love to see uh, every intervention be optimized before it's brought, brought to an RCT. Uh, I realize that's more aspirational than, than anything else, but uh, just more and more applications I, I'm interested in. I just think there's, in particular, lots and lots of exciting opportunities in the area of, of implementation science. And this is my last slide. I just want to point out to you that uh, uh, there are two books that came out. They're quite recent. They came out just last year. Uh, the one on the left is an authored book. It offers a comprehensive uh, introduction to the multi-phase optimization strategy. 
uh, and uh, the one on the right is an edited book that covers a number uh, of advanced topics. And I can recommend these books to you without fear of conflict of interest because uh, they are available for a free download at most university libraries in, in PDF form uh, through the, the Springer, your library Springer portal. So uh, that concludes my presentation, and I would be very happy to uh, listen to any comments you have or, or answer any questions. Thanks, Linda. Um, thanks very much for uh, an interesting presentation. And I, I appreciate, appreciate it particularly your following up on the studies that you presented back in 2013. I do remember that webinar. <laughs> um, it was one of our early ones, and I mm -hmm. appreciated your doing it, and it was fun to get uh, such bases on, on where those studies have gone. A um, uh, number of questions uh, 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 that I'd like to talk about. Um, uh, there really is a lot of interest in figuring out how to do clinical trials uh, at a lower cost. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that uh, the technology that you talked about today offers, at least in terms of promise. Um, uh, the idea that you can build a more efficient intervention uh, and hence, when you deliver it in the, the evaluation phase, it's, it's uh, less expensive to do so, mm -hmm. uh, more cost effective uh, uh, in expectation. Um, but you spend some time and some money uh, on the uh, optimization phase, mm -hmm. where you're testing everything out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you've worked on a bunch of these projects now. Mm -hmm. Can you can you get, speak to the question of mm -hmm. how long does the opt optimization phase usually take? Mm -hmm. Is it a couple of years out of an R01? Is a, at at an R01 sort of budget? Uh, let, let's let's have a sense of that because mm -hmm. uh, you've got a sequence of activities here. You've got the the, the preparation, and then you've got the uh, uh, optimization, and then finally you have the trial. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even sure if it's possible to do all of that in, in a single R01, given mm -hmm. the, uh, the five-year funding uh, uh, scheme that NIH uses in a mm -hmm. routine way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there are uh, several factors that determine how long an optimization trial is going to take, typically. One is, um, and, and some of these are the same factors that determine how long an RCT will take. One of them is, uh, how uh, the stream of subjects comes in. So if, if you're having to recruit ambulatory adults to come in for something the way we did uh, in, in the weight loss project, uh, that it can take a while to, uh, to get enough subjects. On the other hand, in another study I, I'm, I'm finishing up now, uh, it's being done in, in uh, college settings and every fall you get a new crop of subjects all at once. So those are, those, that is just contrasting different ways that this, a subject stream can come in. So if the subject stream is coming in fast, that shortens things. If you have to have time to recruit subjects, that, you know, that makes it longer. A second consideration is how long it takes to implement the intervention itself. So some interventions are really fast. You know, they, can, they are done in an hour. Others require people to come in you know, a couple hours a week for 12 weeks. I mean, there's all kinds of uh, different possibilities there. So that's another uh, consideration. And a third consideration, although there is a way around this, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment, but is, is how long the event horizon is to the outcome. So if the outcome is something that you have to wait years to see, then that's quite a different situation from uh, one where the outcome makes itself known uh, pretty pretty quickly. Now, prevention, unfortunately, is a great example of where often the event horizon is off quite a bit in the future. So you can think of, you can imagine uh, prevention of a second heart attack, for example. Uh, that would probably, you know, to, to evaluate that, uh, would probably take several years, even if even if someone had recently had a first heart attack. And of course, you know, you hope if you're doing a good job preventing, it's going to would take a really long time. So the way around that, I think, uh, gets back to something I I kind of went over quickly in this in this brief talk, but is is really important, and I devoted a whole chapter in the book to it. It's the uh, conceptual model. So the conceptual model 
it, it's like the logic model you're familiar with, but it's actually even more detailed than that. In, in, the, in the conceptual model you use in most, you actually have to show, you have to specify which intervention components are targeting which mediating variable. So you're very, very specific about that. And if necessary, you can use measures of the mediating variables as short-term outcomes and optimize based on that, remembering that you're going to do a formal evaluation uh, in, in the RCT eventually. So that's, that's a way to kind of short, to shorten that, that process. So can you conduct the optimization phase and the evaluation phase in, in one uh, five-year cycle? So the answer is sometimes yes, I've done that. And sometimes, no, I haven't been able to do that in, in other projects. And it just depends on, the, on those factors that, that I talked about before. I also want to talk a little bit about, um, I think, a, a closely related topic, or this actually, I think, was implied in what you were saying, David, is pe some people balk at the idea of, oh, gosh, I have to do, I have to pay for an optimization trial and an evaluation trial, whereas before I only had an evaluation trial. So I, I, want, I want to just respond to that. First of all, I take the long view of 15 or 20 years. That, that's actually why I started out my presentation saying, you know, look back to the 1980s and look at how much progress has been made in, in intervention science. Have we made as much progress as BMW has with the, with, with the 3 Series or uh, Apple has with, with the iPhone in, in that period of time. And I think most people would agree that, no, we haven't made anywhere near that much progress. So that's, that's the, the window of time I'm thinking about. Um, I would argue that although uh, optimization may be more expensive in the short run, it's actually much more economical in, in the long run. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is that um, I think optimization offers us the possibility of incrementally improving interventions in a systematic way over time, so that when we look back over 10 or 15 years, we'll be able to say, yes, today's interventions are measurably, appreciably better along specific dimensions than uh, the ones that we had you know, back, back then. Um, also, uh, if you've conducted an optimization trial, now I'm being just in the short run practicality, if you've conducted an optimization trial, then you have a really good sense based on your uh, estimates of the effects of the individual components. You have a really good sense of the effect size that the, that the intervention package is going to deliver, and that gives you a really solid basis for powering the RCT. So you should be able, I would, I would think, you should be able to power uh, an RCT using using somewhat fewer subjects in, in many cases. Uh, thanks, Linda, very much. There are a lot of questions about power. Okay. And, and you just mentioned it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, you know, a lot of these uh, studies use factorial or fractional factorial mm -hmm. uh, designs. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a question about uh, how, how do we deal with power for that? Because mm -hmm. you've got a bunch of interventions or a bunch of components that you're evaluating and lots mm -hmm. of tests that you're going to do. Mm -hmm. How do you have enough power uh, while avoiding the multiple testing problem? Mm -hmm. That is uh, a complicated question, and I spend a lot of time in my book talking about that. And we could, we could probably talk about that for an hour, um, but I will, I'll try and give you uh, kind of the, the, the short version of it. And I would recommend that uh, anyone who's interested, take, take a look at, at my book, uh, chapters three and, uh, three and four in my book talk about a lot of this. So the first thing I want to say is that setting aside for a moment the issue of, mul of multiple uh, hypothesis tests, we'll come back to that, but setting that aside for, for uh, a moment, um, factorial, the, the 2 to the K, that is a factorial experiment where every factor has two levels. The, this, is, this is the type of factorial experiment that's used typically in engineering for what, what are called screening experiments in engineering when they're quickly trying to see what works and what doesn't work. The 2 to the K design is almost always used for, for those kinds of experiments because, it, because it's so efficient. In a 2 to the K experiment, um, typically, you can add 
a factor without having to increase the number of subjects. And actually, the number of subjects you need to power a factorial experiment has really very little, almost nothing to do with the number of experimental conditions. And, and the, that's very counterintuitive if you have been trained primarily in the RCT. It's because the, the logical underpinnings of the RCT and the factorial experiment are completely different. Um, factorial experiments are, are powered the logic of powering them is, is really different. In a factor, in, in, a, in a, an RCT, the RCT is built to enable one to directly compare the means of experimental conditions because that's, that's, that answers the research question you have when, when you conduct an RCT. But in a factorial experiment, and this is the part that's really, that tends to be really counterintuitive to people, you might have 32 experimental conditions in a factorial experiment, but you are never going to pull out the mean of one condition and directly compare it to the mean of another condition. Instead, you're comparing um, means that are, that are based on aggregates of, uh, of a lot of different experimental conditions. So in, in a factorial experiment, what matters is not the per experimental condition n, it's the n per level of each factor. That's what, that's what matters. And so that's why under most conditions, you can, if you have a two to the k experiment, you can add, you can add more factors and you typically don't, I mean, assuming that the factor you're adding has uh, a same or larger expected effect size, you don't need to increase the n. This is why factorial experiments are, are so efficient. They're very, very efficient. You're kind of getting, um, you're, you're kind of getting repeated duty out of subjects because a particular subject, uh, it, it, that person's data is used for, for to, to estimate the main effect of factor one and the main effect of factor two and the main effect of factor three and, and, and so on. So um, that, all of that is to say that if you're thinking of a, factor, of a 32 condition factorial experiment as a 32 arm RCT and thinking, boy, she must be crazy if, 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 she, if she thinks that you can power that. Well, I would be crazy if I told you you could power a 32 arm RCT, but that's not what I'm saying. A factorial experiment, uh, the, the logic is, is quite different. Having said that, though, it is true that, that the expected effect size of a treatment package is usually larger than the expected effect size of an individual component. And so these optimization trials, uh, you know, they're not, they're not, uh, typically they're not, uh, they're not going to be sufficiently powered with 60 or 100 subjects. Uh, what I'm seeing is that people need in the neighborhood of 250 to 500 subjects to, to power an optimization trial, which is why I always tell people have a lot of factors if you can possibly manage it. Because once you've got the subjects, you might as well, you know, try and get as many uh, estimates out of them as, as, as you can. Now, to get to the multiple comparison part of things, and this, this what I'm about to say is kind of a subtle point, and it's sort of hard to convey um, in a presentation like this, but I'm going to do my best, and if, um, if I don't do a very good job, I hope you'll take a look at chapter three in my book because it's, it, it, it's explained uh, there in a, more, in a more careful way because I was able to sit down and write it then. Um, so in my, in my view, there are two perspectives on the use of, of scientific data that you get from an experiment. One is the conclusion priority perspective and the other is the decision priority perspective. The conclusion priority perspective is the one that we've all been trained to take. In the conclusion priority perspective, uh, your objective is to draw scientific conclusions and uh, you, you are very careful to do uh, hypothesis testing at, at P and at, at alpha of, of 0.05. Um, and if you get non-significant results, you don't say, oh, well, we know there's no difference. You say, we don't know whether there's a difference or not. Now contrast that with the decision priority perspective. And the decision priority perspective is what you take when you're evaluating the results of an optimization trial because, in an opt because you're using 
the results of the optimization trial to make decisions about what components are going to go into the optimized intervention. In with the decision priority perspective, you don't have the luxury of saying we don't know. You have to make a decision on each component. Is it in or is it out? Is it going to be the, the high level or is it going to be the low level? And the whole idea here is you have to use the information you have. It may be imperfect, but you have to use the information you have to make your decisions about what's going to go into the optimized intervention. In a case like, like that, where, where you're using the decision priority perspective, I don't recommend um, generally doing uh, a correction for uh, repeated hypothesis testing. And the reason is that you would lose so much power, and power is really critical here because in many circumstances, mistakenly overlooking an intervention component that's working would be very costly. So what I always recommend is that the investigator thinks about, you know, there's, there's two ways you can make a mistake, of course. We all, we, we all know what they are. You can make a type 1 error, which means that you mistakenly conclude that a component is effective when it isn't, or you can make a type 2 error, which means you mistakenly overlook uh, an intervention component that is effective. Now, somewhere in history, we decided that we wanted the probability of making a type 1 error to be 0.05 or less, but we were perfectly okay with the probability of making a type 2 error to be 0.2, because 0.8 is, is a standard for power. A lot of times, 0.7 is acceptable. That means the probability of, of a type 2 error is 0.3. I always recommend that investigators think about what those numbers really mean and adjust them accordingly. So I, I will often recommend that people increase the type 1 error rate to bring down the type 2 error rate. That's only in the when, when people are taking the decision priority perspective. And you can use the same data and interpret it both ways, which I think is, is completely appropriate. Uh, thanks very much. It, it's it's clear that uh, there's a lot of, of uh, detailed stuff here, and it sounds like you've uh, got some good material for people to read uh, in chapters at least three and four, uh, and I'm sure pr probably elsewhere. Uh, I, I suspect also that that material covers interactions yes. in the factorial design. So I, it does, ask, yeah. I won't ask you to address it, but we'll we'll point people who have been asking questions about yeah. interactions to go go to the same source. Okay. Can, may I say one thing about interactions, yeah. though? Yeah. This is pretty straightforward. Interactions, very, very interesting, very subtle, uh, a lot of very subtle points to make, and that's why I devoted a whole chapter in the book to interactions. But one thing I want to say is that there's different ways you can express the effect size for an interaction. And some of these different ways make different implications. But if, you're, uh, if you express... Uh, an interaction in terms of the regression weight, which is actually what I like to use, and you, you have conducted a 2 to the k factorial experiment, and you use effect coding, which is the standard for factorial experiments in every field except the behavioral sciences, as far as I can tell. So in effect coding, in a 2 to the k experiment, you wouldn't, in dummy coding, you would use 0 and 1, to code the factors. In effect coding, you use minus 1 and 1, which has doesn't sound like much, but actually has a lot of, make, makes a huge difference. Anyway, if you use effect coding and it's a 2 to the k experiment, you have the same power to detect a B weight of a particular size, whether that B weight belongs to an interaction or a main effect. So it's not necessarily the case that you don't have much power for interactions. Uh, we could have an interesting conversation about a versus dummy coding, but we, 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 we won't do that here. Okay. Um, you uh, made reference a couple of times in your comments about group or cluster randomized trials. And mm -hmm. I, I've often asked you this question when we've been looking at one another uh, across a table or standing next to each other in a conference room, but it would be interested in getting your, your thoughts on it now. Mm -hmm. Um, some have suggested that it's very difficult to use this kind of technology or this kind of approach with mm -hmm. a group or cluster randomization. Can you point to any examples where, where you've done that or, or others have done that? Mm -hmm. uh, Danny Almerol, uh has been, I know, has been involved in a SMART that used uh, cluster randomization. And um, here at Penn State, 
uh, there was a cluster randomized trial that used uh, that conduct was a, was a two to the third uh, two to the three uh, factorial experiment and school was a unit of assignment. Um, but I actually uh, haven't seen the results of that study, but I know I know that it was completed. Um, there is uh, an art. There are a couple of articles uh, that were published in uh, the journal Psychological Methods about uh, how you conduct factorial experiments when there is a, a subgroup structure of some kinds. If you it, some kind, so if you have to do uh, cluster randomization, you certainly you certainly can still conduct a, a factorial experiment. You might have to uh, conduct a fractional factorial experiment because you might have enough power, but you might not have enough clusters to populate the cells of a factorial experiment. That, that's, that is one possibility. The power issues are, I would say, about the same as they are in an RCT. And, and you know better than anyone what those power issues are, David. Uh, right. I mean, the the uh, the factors that influence power in group randomization are very similar to individual randomization. We just have an extra uh, issue to wrestle with in terms of correlation within groups. Yeah. But but the the number of uh, what we're solving for is the number of groups rather than the number of people. A and um, uh, if the groups are large, that gets that get that gets complicated. Yes. Uh, in a in a hurry. Yeah. <laughs> but. Um, I, I'm, uh, I certainly will be interested in going to psych methods and trying to find these uh, papers that you refer to, and I suspect others will as well. And there's a chapter about that in the advanced topics okay. also. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, I'm, I'm skimming the questions that we've gotten from um, our audience. Um, are there any uh, specific recommendations for community-based participatory research? Um, I think the issues for community-based participatory research are about the same as they would be in, in an RCT. But one thing I, I will say is it's, it's very easy to set up a factorial experiment so that everybody gets something, that no one has to be in a no treatment or a weightless control which, um, you know, some people in, in some circumstances might see as, as an advantage. Yeah. Uh, can you provide an example of how you assess scalability of intervention? Mm. That, that, you know, that's really an interesting question. No, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> because I don't think people think enough about that. I mentioned that I think there are a lot of opportunities for most in the area of, of implementation science, and that is a direction I would, I would love to head. I've recommended uh, a number of times that people do what, uh, what I call starting at the end, that is before you even design an intervention, go to the, uh, go to the locations or the type of location where you'd expect it to be implemented and get a sense of what are the constraints there, and then engineer an intervention that can be implemented within within those constraints. But generally speaking, uh, and and I, I'm sure I'm sure there are people who are thinking about this, but generally speaking, the intervention scientists that I talk to, at least, don't really think very much about um, the circumstances under which an intervention is to be delivered, and they also don't think very much about the cost or who's going to pay for a particular. Intervention. I, I completely agree. Uh, t too many don't think about how it's going to be done outside of their initial experiment. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think part of that is is due to the fields. Um, and th th what I'm about to say might sound odd, but I think the field overemphasizes effectiveness. And it, it's not it's not that I think effectiveness is a bad thing. I mean, I think effectiveness is great and really important. But it's been the only thing we've thought about for many years. And I think we need to balance effectiveness against uh, efficiency, economy, and scalability. Because so many interventions are developed in academia, and then they end up either never being implemented at all, or implemented in, in a way that's different from how they were originally designed. So who knows if they're, if they're still effective. Well, I, I was encouraged to hear that uh, you've seen so many projects in the 
uh, reporter database that uh, are using some of these methods and uh, FOAs are increasingly uh, pointing to them, certainly I hear. Yeah. I hear the conversation more and more at uh, meetings here on campus that I attend. So oh, that's great. Um, uh, hope that more people will will take advantage. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your presentation and and for a, a very interesting conversation. After, um, let me uh, turn back to Natasha, who will wrap up the, today's presentation. Thank you, Dr. Murray, and thank you to everyone who participated in today's webinar. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we will be posting the slides and recording of today's session on our website next week. You will receive an email with a link to the recording when it is available. Thank you.